Thank you again for the introduction. This time I try to keep my microphone more still, but I'm a very outgoing character, so it's a bit difficult if I have two bits in my hands and I can't uh, move them. Yeah. Um, now I would like to concentrate my lecture on the potentials and limitations of um, participation and get into methods and projects. I will talk around an hour and then have, I'm very happy about your questions because we do love feedback. Yeah, there are quite a few questions which we pose ourselves in the office and with the people we work with. What does participation mean for architecture? What can participation do for identification with the built environment? Does participation make construction expensive or effective, complicated or sustainable? Does participation save time or money? How do built spaces emerge from the desires of the users? What does participation mean for architects' understanding of their professional role? We developed a whole range of methods how to find common grounds with different kinds of stakeholder groups. Participatory design is not a grassroots event. Maybe you're surprised that I'm saying that. Maybe you're objecting, but I will explain how we work as architects. Each participatory process is a careful balance of top-down events and processes. We want to learn as much as possible of the future users and get into a positive, optimistic, and enthusiastic dialogue. We're trying to find a common ground. We like to think together, to fantasize together, get excited about new ideas and visions together. And we do try to get everybody or anybody into this process and give them a chance to involve. Some people don't dare to speak out loud. So sometimes we are coming to the people here when we are designing a community center. We wanted to have also yeah, all groups of people somehow consulting and knowing what they would like to do. And so we went in the streets with some archive of desires. And the question you read here is, what do I love to experience in Büchenbach, which was the name of the place. And from there on, we devised many, many workshops. That was kind of activating, find people who would like to share their ideas, their visions with us. We, the architects, would like to know their needs and at the same time also their desires for the environment. However, how can people communicate their dreams and their desires? There we need new forms of dialogue on equal terms. We work with atmosphere as participatory design strategy, atmosphere in the sense of ambience, atmosphere for its sensations and immediacy, so we all can talk, just like talk like about the weather. If I'm telling you, um, I just was in London, five degrees, and there was a, was a bit foggy, you'd somehow get a feeling how, I, how one might feel at that moment in London. And atmosphere is also the design tool. It's our communication tool with the users, but also inside our team as architects. The great advantage of working with atmosphere as a design tool is that it gives space for uncertainties. 
might sound strange at first, but the vagueness of atmosphere, the fact that you cannot quite grab it, brings contingencies into the communication and design process, which offers opportunity. There, our methods are a bit different from them, which Yuri just showed in the lecture before. And these opportunities, which they offer, they are ambiguous and complex conditions a participatory process can throw up. And these are exactly the conditions we need to work creatively with the user and ultimately as the architect. However, in the daily routine of our work, we still experience quite some suspicion regarding participation. Usually it's the building authorities or architect colleagues which can't quite see how the users can contribute valid knowledge to the design process. But sometimes the client, him or herself, does not trust in the worthiness of their own expertise as users. As users. We are quite often asked, why do you don't do, talk to us? I mean, you know how to build a school. Can we really offer valid knowledge? some of them, and others, of course, demand the involvement. The participation process can mean that the architect has to surrender part of his or her control of the design and construction process. That's, of course, somehow risky, but it does not have to mean that originality and creativity are limited. Yeah, we architects have to understand that our role is changing. We are not anymore in this small room thinking of our fantastic ideas. Some even believe avant-garde is not possible while talking to the users. Participation for us does not mean the architect is the only person or is only the person carrying out the technical implementation of the user's idea. The architect still takes the creative part. He is the creative link. What people know about the demands and desires they have for the use of experience of spaces is a potential social resource which must be taken into account in architecture if a stronger identification of the users with the buildings or with their buildings, their future buildings, is to be achieved, which in turn supports social acceptance of the architectural design. Sociologist Helga Novotny speaks of. So I would like to do this. <laughs> of socially robust knowledge, I think it's a fantastic wording to understand. It's robust. We try to get an idea what people would like. We can draw. The conclusion from our various project that communication about the sanctuary experience is crucial for the interaction between architects and users. It is based on their mutual knowledge of the atmosphere and spatial effect. Depending on the ages, the social and cultural background we develop individual models of participation. No project is like the one before. We always think we find kind of a way through it, but it's always different. The essential components are conceptual and artistic stimuli, which have to be specifically sought outside the specific project context. 
Communication about atmosphere will circumvent the fixed code of the plan. Ah, sorry, I wanted that picture. Um, and make it easier to express even complex, but often unconscious needs and ideas that are often difficult to articulate. Both children and adults can playfully articulate the words they desire. Collages of found images, painted pictures, models, but also the result of target planning games, interviews, storytelling, or film and its spatial projection can serve as such a medium. Architects have the opportunity to develop models of atmosphere from the, required, uh, from the requirements thus formulated. In which the user, for their part, can imagine themselves and thus experience them directly. Participation fosters needs-based design. And there you see the first way to save money, because through participation, you are about to build an environment which the users would love to be in. Just a brief hint to the kindergarten we have built um, yeah, 12 years ago. We started participatory process with kids in 2002. And you will not believe it. I'm sure you will not believe it. Um, 2002, we did the first participatory design with school kids and built the results of it. But we were reminded that was the first and last time you've done this. Six, uh, 17, no, 16 years later, we were commissioned with the first prototypical participatory process in Berlin for schools last year. <laughs> yeah, the kindergarten before and after. We had developed the story with the kids, and here you see the interior and um, exterior space and the connection as you see here, to the garden, which didn't exist before. We believe in effective designing through methodologically regulated decision making. And here would like to explain briefly our Baupiloten method. <laughs> in the middle of everything, of course, there's the project family. There is the user with the extremely valuable everyday knowledge and working with schools. It's fantastic that we have an amazing other exp expertise like the pedagogy. And then there is the client. He looks after the economic feasibility. We advance no um, quite a few conditions which have to be clear, to make clear also to the users that there are conditions, that there are certain requirements, and we don't discuss these requirements. Therefore, I said in the very beginning, it's always a balance between top-down and bottom-up um, strategies. And then there are we, the architects, with our professional expertise doing also the moderation. And what is important in the whole process, that everybody sticks to their own expertise. Doesn't help me very much if the user tells me how to actually make the building. And it doesn't make any sense if I tell the people they have to go to this community center when, and they needs this and this spaces. I wanted to know what they need, what their demands, and desires. We have several steps 
in our process. The first one is that we find common ground, and of course, speaking to different groups or big heterogeneous groups, we have to build a different common space. So we raise awareness for that. Then the user's everyday life. If we, for example, transform a school or student housing, we observe and record the user's everyday lives. Then there is the so-called Wunschforschung. It's probably difficult for the translator. It is fortunate for the desires, but we, it's such a nice German word, we couldn't translate it. Um, so the Wunschforschung is determining needs and desires, and from all that, we start building visions and do think we get fresh ideas beyond prejudice and beyond presumption. And as Yuri also said before, you do need rounds of feedback. We have to know, are we on the right track? Is it interesting for the people what we're doing? So we do think in that way we have quite an effective decision making because we know our way through the users. And we get this needs-based um, architecture which stays affordable because we build immediately the way um, they need to use the building. And in the end, we were lucky enough so far that we have satisfied users and clients. I remind you of the letter. So we work mainly in that part. You have to determine in the very beginning who are the people who get involved. Here you see a moment where we devise the process of participation together with the client. I must say this is rather an exception. Usually we devise the process because the client um, think it's too hard for them. We suggest something and then we discuss the process. So, but I tell you um, how we devise the process. On the upper line here are these different groups of users. And down here, there are different methods from starting just getting introduced to the project, then several projects, several inputs of experts, and in the, fine, in the end, a big party to celebrate um, the achievement. Here, for example, I show some of the cards uh, of workshops which we do, and you see them back here, um, the methods. Now I would like to explore with you, I brought three projects on three different scales. The first project is a school project, so it's a building. The second project is um, a student housing. It's a kind of a community of 13 buildings for six, more than 600 students. And the third uh, project is a neighborhood we worked in. What is quite different in these three scale projects, in the school, you know the users, and they're extremely happy that you spend time with, that, him, uh, with them, and that you develop with them together a vision for the new school or the transformation of an environment. The second one, the student housing, you have a quickly changing, at least in Germany, a quickly changing community. The students might stick around only for half a year and then the new ones. So you don't have a certain group of people. And the third one was the neighborhoods. It's usually angry people who come, who hate you because you identify their place, and so on and so on. So it's quite exciting with each project you have different conditions, so you need a different design um, process. I start with the school. It's a um, uh, Wolfburg. It's the city of. Um, it's a car city, um, really, which was founded in the Nazi time. It's, it's a quite. A, but this is just a site. It's an interesting uh, city development. Um, okay, but we were confronted with the school of the 70s, and we were asked 
to give them um, common communal space to change um, the classrooms and to devise um, a cafeteria. In this diagram, you see the overlay of the participatory process and of the work stage. This is a diagram um, with which I explored all the projects um, of us in this book. Here you see obviously the project started with quite a few workshops which is sort of, um, yeah, uh, helped each other. There was some synergy between this um, workshops and there was one other one for feedback and in this school, the school, the, that was it. Very brief participatory process, but I think we got a lot out of um, the people. With some schools, they're really happy working with us and to or totally excited. We have every month or something um, another workshop and we have the kids being the critics of the design. And so it's lots of fun. But some like it uh, be very effective because teachers, I'm sure it's everywhere the same, just don't have very much time. Together with a project family, which consisted of teachers, it was just a, a smaller project family. We also work sometimes with hundreds of people. I guess the biggest one was a thousand young people um, to develop a chapel. And sometimes we work with that many people because it's always a win-win situation um, for the users. For example, when we um, developed the chapel, the church just wanted to know how do young people see the church? How does the space have to be um, formed? What does the space have to allow for so they come to church? But in other um, institutions, in that case, there were something like 15 people, like a family. It was teachers, parents, they were uh, members of the city of Wolfsburg, so the authorities, and some elder students. And they did collaging. This is one workshop where we try to find out with the users what should be the future atmosphere, what f should be the future ghost um, of this place. And it was amazing when the student showed this collage she called the Calm Giant's Meadow. There was like, like a wow in the room. That was just an atmosphere most of, or all of the project family really immediately liked. And for her, it represented the shared notion of the group very well. And she said, on this meadow, one should feel comfortable and able to exchange ideas and communicate. One should be able to relax there. And she said, between classes, so she was a nice student. Furthermore, it should be a lounging meadow. There's a feeling of security given by the tall grass. So the participants are asked not only to do a collaging of their future desire um, environment where they like to learn, but also stick and yeah, stick around, but they have to find a title, in that case, the Calm Child Meadow, and they write a text about it, which they get from this collaging. So it's quite a spontaneous um, exercise, which works really well. And this triggers an amazing um, discussion about the future space. Another um, teacher was discussing or presenting his collage calling the Flexi Islands. And that collage triggered the idea, yes, we do want an eight room. It should be of different 
islands of different atmospheric and pro programmatic qualities. Because in the beginning they didn't know how open it should be and so on. In a complementary workshop, we did the negotiate dream space. There was the old plan of the building, and then they started to, <laughs> to put actions, activities there, what should happen in the atrium. Um, the colorful circles show um, atmospheric quality. It's a zoom in, you see actions, activities, and the qualities of atmospheric. And the funny thing is, they wanted to relax underneath um, the new, that they knew already there's gonna be a staircase in the middle of the space. Um, they wanted to have the relaxing corner there. And I said, what a strange idea, having a relaxation corner um, underneath the stair. But we listened to them and we tried to discuss their needs. And um, we analyzed the data and understood they need a quiet study zone, they need a group work zone, they need a relaxation corner, they need a kind of marketplace, and surrounded by glass rooms. And um, there will be a homework zone, an observation experimentation zone, relaxation zone, and a gallery wall. And from this data, we devised the building. Um, you will see in a moment, it's gonna be downstairs. It will be more lively, and the further you go up, it's gonna be more quiet, also architectural-wise. And we come back with, in this case, with a big model, one to 20 scale. This shows now the cafeteria that we devised for the building, and we could discuss uh, what the quality should be, how it should, and we also had very small models, so we could talk also about the general atmosphere of it, but up to one to 20, because some do not understand smaller conceptual models, and we try to get everybody involved, or the possibility to judge the design. And you, here you see a plan, so this is the big atrium with a staircase there. This is kind of the marketplace, very lively marketplace. The study corner and here the very quiet um, studying. The glass rooms around it and it was also important to open up somehow the glass rooms to give some connection between that and that um, space. The sections through the building, the cafeteria, and the atrium, the two-story atrium. Before, there was the ceiling going through and it was a really dark space. And now it's extremely sunny and light. You see the marketplace, a kind of a tiny um, stage. You might exhibit some bits and pieces, um, some studies or just on proper chairs and proper um, tables, and in that area you have, you can sit as ever you want. You can sit very closely together. Sometimes um, young people like, especially in that part, they somehow sit more on top of each other than next to each other. It's so crowded and I guess that's what young people like. But others like to sit on the table. And that is a moment which is, was really funny. It's this relaxation area, and it was really used a lot. And architectural-wise, of course, it solved as a big problem. Usually, uh, yeah, what would you do? You put a pot of flowers there that they don't go through because you can hurt your head if you just walk through. And this one pre uh, pre uh, prevented from accidents, and so it was just a wonderful, um, solution to it. The corner where you just study quietly with a view to the marketplace, the upper floor, and here sometimes the students sit with their laptop on the lap. 
a view into the cafeteria, and that part was extremely important and um, interesting enough, the students and the teachers made a collage where they showed something, it was, uh, was even orange, uh, something like a, um, um, how do you say, an arena where you can sit more casually, informally, meet. The students thought, what a stupid idea with this Mensa, you only use it for two, three hours. We could use it also in between um, lessons. That was the one thing, that this was a special bit. And the, the tables can be devised as one row next to each other, or um, what most of them wanted, they wanted to have it more informal and not to sit so formalized with one class there, next class um, there. And so you have, yeah, you can put it together as ever comes to your mind. The chill out space. Now I, now I come to the second project, the student housing, the next scale. Again here, you see the same diagram with the work stage and the participation. You see here, there are more often um, workshops for FO, which stands for feedback. That's, we did a lot in the beginning to explore, um, to explore the habits of the students. My, my students, I worked with, this was a project where I did the participatory process with uh, my students at the University of Technical, um, the Technical University of Berlin. And there, my students, for example, stayed a whole weekend at one of the 40 student housings which we do have in Berlin. And the big moment is when we create the fiction, the story about the project, which we develop slowly but surely together with the user. For that project, we devised our first game, planning game, which are extremely helpful to loosen up. To, because if I ask, I don't know, if I ask you, how do you want to live? Yeah? Well, that would not be enough for us. We really want to know how would you love to live in futures together with lots of people. And if you just ask this question, I mean, it wouldn't work differently with, if somebody asked me, how do you want to live? Um, I can't give like this um, a complex answer. But the game enables that you find out how you might want to live. So people after the game, thanked us for finding out how they wanted to live. Um, yeah, this was our first game. And there, everybody um, still played their own living vision. It again consisted out of activities and atmospheric qualities. There were the four big letters, learning, sleeping, eating, showering because we thought everybody um, needs to do that. So we, uh, we were wondering where they put it, whether they put it in the, their private zone, which was inside the circle, or outside. And then we had all these activities. And so you don't take forever going through all the activities. We had categories. I'm a musical guy. I'm a party animal. I'm a workaholic. I'm pensative. I'm uh, a player, I'm communicative, and um, quite a few more. Yeah, so each person sort of played their vision, like 30 to 40 um, minutes. And ah, I got even the... But maybe 
maybe I should say one more word to it. Um, each one, a single person played their vision, but there were lots of them. There were something like 40 people uh, playing it, so we had 40 visions to look at it and try to compare that and see where are the commonness and where are the specific ideas. And now in our games, there are always negotiations. There are something like seven, eight people around the table negotiating their ideas. And they are different, a heterogeneous, heterogeneous group um, of people. Because it doesn't make any sense, for example, if you build a school, that the friends sit together and they anyway have one idea. But we ask them to negotiate, and in the very end, we compare all the negotiation. There's always, um, I mean, I also want to talk about the limitations of participation. You have to pay attention that you don't take particular interests. You have to find, try to find out what is one which um, comes very close to the idea of many. That, that's why we speak always of the best of solution. Uh, actually, not the best of, the best possible um, solution. Yeah, here is um, just two pages of my book. Um, that was the moment, the diary of my students, where they stayed two days in the housing, uh, existing housing of Berlin, student housing in Berlin. And here on the left side, I always explain what we have done, why we have done, and how do you use it in the future architecture. So it's an everyday, everyday life report of the users. And from all the findings of every single workshop, we have done many more. Um, ah, and what I might also say is when we devised the game, we had interviewed beforehand 300 students about their idea, how they wanted to live together in a group. So that was our first, uh, there was the first step. There were interviews, and from all the activities, um, which the interviews, interviewees um, said, we made the activity cards and all the atmospheric quality. So the words weren't an invention of ourselves but of um, the users. Good, and from all these findings, we, um, we devised the modules for, um, for the housing, and we had a diagram of living spheres, which referred back to the original idea of the student housing of a personal sphere, an everyday sphere, a leisure sphere, and a public sphere. And on the left, you see the colors of the bits and pieces. So for the students, it was extremely important, the communication inside and outside. And so we devised, um, if you see Ian the Green, for example, I go now to um, the next one. We devised um, sports fields. Uh, climbing, we play sports together. We thought of um, um, together places where you can relax, you can learn, where you do some gardening together. And in the private sphere, we cook and eat together, and we are environmentally conscious and co working, co learning, and all what um, the students worked out. And out of all this, we devised a master plan for the 13 buildings. And so we had a house for party animals and coffee drinkers, where the students would go who, yeah, who come maybe to Berlin more than to party than to learn. And then the pavilion gardening living, so you have more um, relaxed, quiet. And the house for urban garden lovers, which was the first project. We have done, as we actually build, then the one which we just finished um, a few months ago, the house of the team players high rise, 
uh, there is the house for music and fitness lovers and the ones who have a quiet life on the edge of a small forest. And now I lead you through some of the photos of the built and transformed project. We do really actually work till 2007 um, with this project. And here it still says 2020, but I think it's going to take us longer because it takes always one building after the other. Then it's evaluated and so on. And the master plan. So um, we sort of sorted out um, the atmosphere also from the outside. There was some interest in feeling the nature and the sports activities. And I, here's the team player, and that's the first building I'm going to um, show you. In the middle of the whole um, student housing estate, there was a square uh, which should connect between the one side and the other. And interesting enough, this was another architect than that one, and they're both extremely good architects uh, who knew very well to do social housing. So they designed housing on a very small scale. So you will see the rooms are something like 10 square meters. And in Germany, they're supposed to be now 14 square meters. But it, it does work. And we try to learn very much from the former architects. We enlivened um, the space in between all the buildings with the outdoor living room and the sports behind. It's always busy. And the first project, the main thing we have done with all the buildings is that we opened them up. Before, you couldn't get out of this building. I mean, there was a door, one door. But you couldn't get out from your flat. So we put lots of terraces in front of it. And it was a listed ensemble. So we had to negotiate very, very intensively with the conservatory um, authorities. And here are flats, and here are single um, rooms of 10 square meters. And since it was the first building, our client wanted us to explore um, a little bit. And we could put three rooms together, which would share two people with a common space in between, with a little shower, and a kind of living room on 10 square meters. <laughs> From the outside, so you see we opened it up. Um, and even the window wasn't there. All these windows you're going to see in a moment are all new. And they are this balcony element. Because it's a house of the urban garden lovers, they should have the chance also to grow their own vegetables or whatever they want, or flowers. And that's a private one, and that's um, the common ones all along the facade. I just go, I think, now quickly through the photos so we don't, it doesn't take too long before or after. The three single rooms put together for two. There was this tiny bathroom and um, the living room here, sleeping, here, sleeping. And what was nice to see this terrace full of flowers and how the students increased their urban gardening um, ambitions and more and more. And what was really sweet, I thought, was that they even looked at the color, that here was pinkish like that one. Here they tried to match the green colors. So they were kind of continuing the design. The next building, Quiet Life at the Edge of a Small Forest, we did do a different strategy. This is the house where the people just, their main ambition is just to study, but in a very pleasant um, environment. That's one of the top flats. It's quite amazing. And we offered terraces, more private terraces, which are now hidden um, with plants. A third building, the house for music and fitness lovers. So I go now 
quickly through it. And each house has different um, features. Like there are special small spaces where you can exercise the piano or whatever instrument or singing, whatever is important to you. And on the top, there's always this amazing flat chair. Here, in that case, the Golden Girls. In the high rise, for example, it's the Bronx Boys. <laughs> the pavilion of the garden life has a more, um, yeah, really family life. This is um, just a three-story uh, three building which opens up to the garden. And what we have done, we opened it now also to the street so that it could connect better to their neighboring students, the inside. It's tiny, the flat. And the, yeah, it's like 10, and not, not the flat, the, the room. And the client didn't believe us that we get everything we've, he saw in the drawing into the room. So we had to build it one to one in life scale to convince them, and they were immediately convinced. It's just that we really more or less copied the original interior, which was just so clever, um, designing the space. And the common space, which is, which is the kitchen, and we open it up to a shared um, dining, and again, you see it's open to the outside, they can grill. The high rise section, which we, uh, the team players, players high rise, which we just um, finished, it's developed with, um, yeah, from a bright yellow to, to a more bluish tone, and that's all done um, with lights. All the buildings, um, are the total transformation because we just didn't work anymore. All the um, house technic, um, God, how is it called? Uh, the whole technical and, uh, equipment had to be changed. And a big topic, of course, in this building is the security because of fire, also the fire protection. That's a big, big topic and extremely expensive. And the acoustics are also terrible. And therefore, uh, you might think it was a bit strange that we sorted out um, the houses according to different wishes of the people, of the students. But it had to do as well. If you want to really study and you are in this party animal house, you can't, you're not happy studying. And so, the students can choose, oh, I'm more the study person, I would love to go there, or I'm more the party person, and I go to um, the other space. I don't have the photos yet, they're soon to come. Again, here, we opened up and tried to um, define more common space, and we won the competition uh, for the high rise because we sort of found spaces we got as many flats which had been there before, and additionally, we got uh, a laundrette, we got a little atelier, we got a little workshop, and now it's used really well. Also, this is just a, um, a recent photo. It's actually used too well. Sometimes also the neighbors come, and now the Student Housing Association uh, want us to think about it, how to keep the neighbors out of it because they leave all their rubbish. That's also a very interesting challenge. And I guess this is also this fencing. I like the word how you used it, defense. I thought, wow, that's, that's a good one. I have to take that, uh, keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and what we tried eight years later, after we've done the first um, participation, to work again with students. How did student life change. That was a bit of a um, theorist approach. <laughs> and then we found out that students nowadays, they want to share much more than they did before. Like 
now in 2015, 62.5% of the students want to share, uh, want to sleep in the space, as a, a half private, half public. And before, it was 76% who wanted to have it private. And it's really a tendency with students, at least in, um, in Germany, that they like to share more space, that they now think about it, because also in Berlin, flats, which were till recently extremely cheap, <laughs> you know, that's why Berlin is a young city, because everybody could afford it, but now sort of, space gets rare and now they share big flats and they find the space where they sleep um, together in one room where they cook where they live where they work um, and so on and so on and this is really the one-to-one -one reflection of how society develops at the moment to sharing now i get to the third scale, I go fast through it. Oh, sorry, we started a bit late. Oh. Neighborhoods in the neighborhood. We developed that part. We were asked to device a design with very dense housing. And all the little dots are family housing. One house for each um, family with at least one car. So we um, prepared for discussions. That was our um, model and with which we explained our design, and we used it then at the workshop as a tool. So we said we don't want to confront the people with one new neighborhood, with, but with smaller neighborhoods um, in the area. And we try to keep the scale quite low at the edge. But of course, a housing estate who asked us, they wanted to have it really high. <laughs> so you work as the architect always with this conflict. And we demonstrated the model, and then also um, this drawing was quite important. Here were the housings. And that um, lila color was sort of the offer to the neighborhood. And in one block, and the reddish color was the public um, offer, like a bicycle workshop, like a cafe, like a co-working um, workshop. So you see one, two, three, four, five, eight smaller neighborhoods. Then we prepared these little flags, which had programmatic and atmospheric qualities. So you see the programmatic, here atmospheric qualities. And um, again, the flags, we have here activities and categories. So you could choose with commun communicative um, category or an engaged one, domestic creative activities, sporty and secluded. So because things always have to be quick. Nobody has really much time. And then um, atmospheric qualities, flags, which were spaces of circulation, spaces of open space, spaces of community, and also how housing topology. Because till you explain how it might look, a tiny picture often is extremely helpful. And then we had to do in, I think, um, one and a half hours, we had to have three rounds of people working on this model. We started with the first, they uh, discussed, and we tried to give them activities and try to uh, motivate people and inspire people that through the new housing, there might be also new chances for them. There might be potential for them. There might be activities which they also like. 
So we wanted to give them the possibility that they have an advantage of it, not only a disadvantage, like lose parking lots. This is one of the biggest topics. But it was this open idea workshops, and they discussed where that could happen what, like a, a tiny bakery or playground or this uh, workshop, as a bicycle workshops and so on. And even after we finished, they didn't stop um, talking and discussing what might happen there. And from there, from these findings, um, we overworked the model, um, of course, and instead of having six neighborhoods, there is going to be now this one neighborhood which is combined with a parking, um, uh, parking building. Because that was their big fear. The big fear was parking and loss of sun. And we worked out sort of criteria for the new housing, like um, the community amenities, other these common spaces. I go quicker through it. Um, an alley just to the courtyard, so you keep privacy to your own neighborhood. Then a public greenaway through the whole site. Then um, barrier-free shared space. Sorry, I started sort of the wrong place. I should have started here from big scale to smaller scale. So shared space, public greenaway, um, the community amenities, and then um, through this alley, you get to your own neighborhood, which is a bit more hidden, and you have communicative communal courtyard. And the whole um, new neighborhood is 250 flats. A view into the neighborhood was quite challenging because we didn't, we sh were not supposed to show any architecture. So we had kind of um, work without showing an architecture. It was quite um, a challenge. So it should be lively, people get together. And the final um, part of my lecture is a few slides about negotiate visions through planning games. I already showed before this prize-winning um, vision game, vision planning game, which allows you to go in 17 steps and 100 minutes um, to a vision, for example, for the school. And what is important when you do negotiation, I just I mentioned it before, is the diversity of people. And we do work, for example, if we work with a school, we have 10 or 12 tables, always with something like seven people. There shouldn't be too many, because otherwise, if you have too many people around it, others might be too shy to say something. So it's, again, it's very much a balance between um, yeah, the negotiation between different characters, but also allowing and hearing um, the more shy people. So it has to be always a low treasure, um, these workshops. Yeah, we, we inspire people to think um, very freely about their project. That's how um, the game starts. And you go for each step, you have kind of an action card, just like a game. We, had to, we tried to get as close as possible to um, a game. And as also the first game, we work with activities. But this time it's easier because it's also with a picture, you can see it more quickly. Um, we devised also with Chinese. Um, the activities, of course, change there a bit because different culture, different activities at the school. So that's the one category. And the other ones are the atmospheric quality. And you could compose areas where you think, well, I could combine um, making my homework. I'm going to work self-organized. I improvise. 
And at the same time, I might like to look at nature. And there are these many tables discussing about their vision, which is then the outcome of it. I'm now not getting um, more into it, but it's an architectural concept in a way. And if we are 10 groups or 12 groups, they present it to each other, so we know where the priorities are, where the way might go. And that's the first workshop, big workshop we do with schools, and then the next feedback rounds, as I showed in further, um, in the first project, will follow. Here are the presentation of the results. And we do believe, because that's, the, that's what a lot of people are afraid of, but we believe that well-managed participation saves time, money, and a lot of tensions. To then finally get, as I said in my first little talk, to quality architecture. Because you do an architecture, we really get into with the users, and it's sort of made with love. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm an activist, I'm a neighborhood activist. We have 250 apartments. And you mentioned that all the neighbors are usually mean and unhappy and they hate you, and I agree with you. We have very uh, soon concluded through WhatsApp, through drivers, and, you know, the moms and children, through the residents who have different pets. Uh, we kind of uh, we're able to agree on what we want to improve in our uh, in our community space and how we want to change it and adapt it, etc. So it wasn't as difficult. I mean, as long as it was for you in your example. However, the problem is to preserve it. The problem is to maintain the change and the transformation that we had. Clearly, we don't want any fencing, right? We won't have no fence. But the security or risks demand us to impose a measure that will help us maintain and preserve these innovations or transformations. So uh, do you have electrical fences or electronic fences? Um, did you have them? Uh, do you have more of those, less of them? Would they have been prohibited and banned or they're still allowed? Uh, and I think in our country, the only way is not the vegetation, not the plants instead of a fence, but electrical fence for at least five years to make people understand that it's someone else's property that has been paid for, that some money was invested and so on and so forth. So, electric and electronic fences. We don't have them at all, and I will be curious to see whether you have them in Germany and how you use them. No, we don't have them. And it wouldn't really our way of working because we try to work with the people and while working with them, and that refers also back to your question, is that they identify with the work. Like the first school project we have done in 2002, it was in a socially difficult area. And everybody said, well, maybe 10 years this project wanna keep, or they wished it would keep 10 years, but they were afraid it wouldn't. But it still exists today. And the students, the pupils, and the whole school looks after it and it's in very, very good um, conditions. And that's what I mean with inheriting the idea. Because this, I met once a kid who came up to me, oh, he comes from this wonderful school where the kids um, plant their own, other where we, he was saying we, we plant our schools ourselves. And it sounded great. And I said, what school are you from? Because I thought I would know about this kind of project. And then he named the school which I devised with my students then. I never have seen this, um, this kid. And he talked, we designed the schools. Because it's this feeling, we students can um, be part of decision making. And especially in schools or places when, which are more socially deprived areas, um, in identification with the school or some communal space is extremely important. And sometimes working uh, with us or other 
officers, is for them the first time that they felt it's effective what I'm doing. And that's extremely important. And if you have done something yourself, you look after it, you care for it. And so we have a very good um, feedback that they keep and appreciate the, the work. And sometimes they kind of um, try to delve into, uh, further into the story and extend it in some way. You don't believe that? Why not? That's how it works. <laughs> I, I don't understand any. So the question is not about the owners or the residents of a particular neighborhood. It is about the alien people, the outside. You remember that um, student housing, yeah, they said that the neighboring communities brought garbage and they would litter. We don't mind the garbage, we can collect it, we can pick it up, etc. But um, the challenges with other problems like crimes or you know drug usage and so on. That is why we want to fence our house from those from those who do not want to create, who do not want to participate, that who want to destroy and break it. And also breaking and destroying it easy with creating takes uh, years. So that's why there are many people and there are more, I mean, they're higher in numbers, those who want to destroy, destroy compared to those who want to create and to preserve. As neighborhood of the student housing, we still didn't put um, any fence and we don't want to put any fence and they don't as they don't destroy anything, but um, they leave some rubbish. And that's quite something really difficult. Also in the student housing, if you go in some of the kitchens, um, they are not the cleanest. So they have um, cleaners going through the housings every few days and to clean it because they, groups of students wouldn't clean it. But I think, unfortunately, also when I go to university in my um, seminar rooms, they're not really clean. That's a difficult challenge. But um, we're going to think about it, whether we find a solution. I think it's extremely hard. We at least got to the point that they don't destroy anything and they keep it careful. Because I think it does also inspire other people, um, or they appreciate it, that the neighborhood was up, uh, updated and done. Yeah, so I don't have any, I'm not a magician, um, but we wouldn't put any fence. And I don't think um, you can educate people in that way, especially not people you don't have control of. Can be any neighbor can change next week. So we're working on it. Uh, Hello, the Center Public Foundation. My name is Julia. As for the previous question, we are having a neighborhood uh, communities project now by a participatory approach. We have similar problems and similar challenges. I think it's all about the engagement and participation of all the residents who live in that particular space. It's not a question for an architect, it's not a question for a mediator, someone who facilitates the participatory design. It is a question of personal responsibility of the residents, and that is my opinion. So and when we had uh, uh, group M8, uh, they spoke about that experience that after the space was transformed, uh, the level of responsibility and engagement of the residents really improves and they kind of rethink their approach to the space. And it doesn't only transform, the residents themselves change and the residents change, the attitude changes. And the marginal groups or disenfranchised group, they actually stop being there because the, the attitude is different and they no longer tolerate that that uh, attitude to the space. So my question is as follows. Thank you for your lecture. You said you have a toolkit that's even available in Chinese, but uh, do you have it in for sale? 
or where can we get it? Yeah. A very practical question. It's a very good tool, it seems. Um, yes, and um, it's uh, yeah, and it's very successful uh, with the with the schools, and they're all excited about it. And authorities, but we decided not to sell it yet because we're very much interested in getting shop, jobs of participation with this tool, and we realized um, that very many people in Germany and I guess all over the place do very quick superficial um, participation. And so we are afraid if we give out that tool and you immediately, you very, very quickly have a result that they just take it. But um, when we got the results from each workshop, we explore it further and we work it through in our office to devise a second specific game um, for the school to get a better understanding what they want. And therefore, at the moment, we don't sell um, the game. And um, by the way, maybe I come briefly back to your question. Um, excuse me, I wanted to just say something because I just remembered we, we're going to have soon a meeting with a student housing um, client and we want to suggest him um, that we do now, after all these years, another workshop with the students and the residents. Because then, 2007, we were sort of in the beginning of our work and of our workshops. And with each workshop, of course, we learn more and more. <laughs> we learn more and more and more. And now, nowadays, we wouldn't only work with the students. We would work also with the authorities, with the politics, and we would work um, with the residents around it. And we thought of maybe trying to do now a um, sort of an evaluation workshop with the people around this because they're extremely happy using it. I mean, you have to go there on weekends and it's full of people. So it's somehow it's a good thing. So if you do give the fans, this is a different conservation. If you put now a fence, you sort of take away from the neighborhood. But it's a challenge. Here's the client who has to pay for it, and others use it. So I think it's a um, bigger frame of things. And participation also in Berlin is not, as we're still developing and fighting um, all the time. Or oh, pushing it. Let's say fighting is a bit negative, pushing it. Ну, кажется, мы на этом завершаем уже. Um, есть вопросы, мы видим, но я думаю, что сейчас зададим, да? Один вопрос тогда зададим. Hello, uh, I can ask the question in English. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, but maybe it's not good because other people might not understand English and then that's oh, translated. Okay. What? Or is it fine if I ask in English? Yeah, okay. Um, so we saw the examples in Germany where the participation has worked, and as you showed, uh, I would like to explain uh, the situation here. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to introduce this kind of participatory architecture. For example, uh, in many times it's the government who decides and imposes to the citizens what they want, but not the citizens who decide to do the things. So uh, my question is how, for example, as a proactive citizen, I can uh, propose my ideas and who do I reach out, how do I reach out, and how is it regulated in Germany, for example? That is my question. I'm not sure whether we are better organized than you here. We, um, I find it, I mean, I have been out to a few post-Soviet uh, countries and there were, and you call yourself activist. I don't call myself activist. I am an architect and there is a client who asks us to devise um, the school or a neighborhood or whatsoever. But um, if you, if I would be an activist, I can go to their um, kind of offices which are locally um, they are spread all over Berlin, especially in socially deprived areas. There I could go 
and tell them, well, I think um, we have this problem. Can, can't we do something with it? Is there somehow a budget? Can I um, organize something? Can I talk to people? And I try to um, get a plan and ask for a foundation. And if you're lucky, you get chosen. So you have the chances, sometimes with not very much money. I don't know, um, maybe a thousand um, euros and maybe 5,000 euros if you get more money. Um, but there you can, and I guess it's the same here, then you can at least start to push um, things ahead, like the first um, school project we have done, 2002, was done in that way, that the teacher, the head of school, she wanted to work with the kids to think about their uh, perfect school, where they like to learn. Yeah, so it was her. So she, I guess, was the activist, and she asked us to help her, uh, help us as architects. It was, but it was the first project for us as well. So it was an extremely interesting experience. And then we had some design, and she applied again, and got more and more um, money. And so you have these little local offices where you can go to. Yeah. So that's a really nice structure. Well, with that, uh, let us uh, finish our second national workshop. The question that you have could be discussed at the very end. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Urban Forum Kazakhstan team, to you first of all, for and you for coming, for spending time here, for devoting your time here to uh, learn and to hear our exceptional speakers from Germany, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. We're also very thankful to the experts who have accepted our invitation, who flew from their countries to Almaty, who generously shared the experience. We are now inspired and we will be applying the participatory design tools in Kazakhstan. For today, we do not have the residents of Almaty, but the representative of other cities of Kazakhstan, and that was amazing. Also, on behalf of Urban Forum Kazakhstan, I would like to thank our partners, uh, QLab, for giving us this Space, Goethe Institute for inviting Susan Hoffman, beautiful source fan Kazakhstan. Thank you so much and see you next year. Today we had the second international workshop on participatory design. We will continue this legacy and next year we look forward to seeing you again and talking to you about this and the idea that we will have implemented. Thank you so much. <laughs>